Count City Council meeting. Uh, this is the Council for the Library and Observa Observatory Board, Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency. And this is our regular meeting. And it is Thursday, May 16th, and it is 1 o'clock or thereabouts. So uh, we'll start off with the flag salute. And if we will all stand, I will lead you. Please place your hand over your heart and salute the wonderful flag of our wonderful country. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United, United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you. And now, Chrissy, would you call roll? Certainly. Council Member Kite? Here. Council Member Townsend? Here. Council Member Weil? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hobart? Here. And Mayor Smotrich? Here. Okay, moving on to the uh, presentations. And we have four of them today. And we will start with our BERT uh, people. And this is Dennis Maletti. And okay, Mary Lou Souter is in the audience, but she's going to let him handle it alone. Thank you. And Thank Mary Lou Souter actually is our chairperson of our wonderful emergency preparedness. Commission, and she's here for all the events that uh, uh, are related to, and she's got great support from everyone. Thank you for being here. And she's here to make sure I do a good job. Oh, we know you will. Okay. Mayor Smotridge, members of the city council, uh, our city manager, staff, I'm here representing the Rancho Mirage Emergency Preparedness Commission, once again, to inform you about our third annual business emergency preparedness meeting. It's coming up in June, on uh, the 3rd of June. It begins at 9 in the morning. The doors open at 8.30. It's at the library. It's a spectacular program. Nothing we've ever done for businesses even comes close to what we're doing. And the reason is, is last year we asked the participants how could we improve the program. They told us and we listened. So the program basically has two parts. First, we have a world-class speaker, the immediate past president of BICEP. That's Los Angeles County's business consortium for emergency preparedness put together by uh, has been in, in operation for 40 years. And uh, he's going to present a history of that organization, what it's like and what it's accomplished in the greater Los Angeles area. And then share with us his own personal experience from when he was the emergency manager for Warner Brothers Motion Pictures. Uh, and he put together an emergency plan for that studio before the Northridge earthquake, then the Northridge earthquake happened, and he can understand the impacts of business preparedness on disaster response firsthand. And he's gonna share that with uh, the people who attend this meeting. Um, then uh, we put together the Emergency Preparedness Commission along with uh, his help. Um, Chris Wright is his name, I don't think I said his name. Uh, a uh, list of handouts, and we're handing out checklists. We're handing out three types of documents. The first type of document is business continuity planning. We have two checklists for participants to take with them, uh, and those checklists were put together by the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the Institute for Business and Home Safety, um, which is the nation's National Clearinghouse for Business Preparedness, funded by our nation's insurance companies. Uh, that's for continuity planning. For your information, it's very difficult to get your hands on continuity plan checklists because people in that business don't give them out. They want you to hire them as consultants uh, and pay for it. Well, we've got two that are in the public domain and we're passing them out. Uh, then we're passing out two uh, disaster preparedness guides for businesses. Uh, and then we're also passing out a guideline for employees. 
And the way we're passing them out is unique. We're passing them out on a thumb drive so that people who attend the event can take the thumb drive with them and duplicate them and share them with whomever they choose to do so. So I'm thrilled about this event. I don't know how we're ever gonna do a better business and emergency response training than the one we're going to have early this June. And I want to be sure that anyone and anyone, whether you live in Rancho Mirage or not, particularly if you have a business in Rancho Mirage, uh, come to this and uh, uh, attend and uh, enjoy what we have to present. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Well, thank you so much, Dennis. It is very exciting, and you make it sound even more exciting. And I know that you mentioned June 3rd, but on the, the screen it showed June 4th. Well, thank you so much, Mayor Smotrich. It is, in fact, June 4th. I made a hey, mistake. No. Not the first time. Well, okay. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's always uh, a pleasure to hear you speak. Uh, when you do our town hall forums at the library, you, you get an overflow house, and uh, rightfully so. You are a gem, and we are delighted that you uh, take the time to serve us and serve our communities. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Now we'll move on to another presentation, and this is going to be introduced by Ted. Thank you, Iris. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Julie Mackinnon. Uh, executive editor, if you'd come up to the uh, uh, rostrum, and Nicole Hayden, the reporter. Uh, I want to welcome you uh, both on behalf of the entire city council. Uh, Charlie Townsend, who you'll hear from a little later, is really our point person at the city on homelessness. And this emanated uh, uh, over the weekend when I read your wonderful story in the newspaper about uh, homelessness in the Coachella Valley and the feature that, uh, that you have, uh, Nicole having interviewed 200 people. And uh, what caught my mind uh, or I was the statistics about 86% of the <coughs> homelessness having insurance. That I found to be a shocking statistic. But it, it stimulated me enough to say that I really don't know a lot. And therefore, I was motivated by your symposium that's coming up uh, on May 30th. And I thought this would give you an opportunity to talk about it. So if you would, welcome. Thanks, Ted. I really appreciate the invitation. And it's so nice to um, see everyone here. I've met some of you, um, but not all of you. I became editor of The Desert Sun in October. And... Um, I came from the LA Times and before that, the New York Times and Washington Post, and I'm just delighted to be here in the Valley. Um, one of the things that we're most focused on uh, right now in terms of coverage is the homelessness issue. Um, but I'll just say a few general words of introduction about what we're up to, and then we'll focus on the event. Uh, this is me, and this is a little bit about my background. And the Desert Sun, uh, just a quick status update. We have 31 reporters, editors, and photographers right now. We are the biggest news source in the Valley. We're going to increase that to about 35 by the end of the year. Really proud to say that in an era of media consolidation, we're actually expanding. And a big part of that is community support. Um, Nicole is our health and homelessness reporter. <laughs> And uh, she's been really dedicated to this topic for the past almost year now, uh, doing a lot of on the ground work with the homeless population in the Coachella Valley, really trying to learn and understand what's at the heart of this issue and how we can all work together uh, for some progress. Um, you know, a lot of our job is writing articles and publishing them, and that's all great, but I think to really move the ball forward on an issue as complicated as this uh, really takes more than that. So uh, we're trying to bring our journalism to the community, uh, have engagement um, opportunities for people to get involved. So one of those events we're having is coming up uh, May 30th at the UCR Palm Desert campus. Um, just a few, before, we'll return to that in just a second, but I did want to highlight 
uh, some of Nicole's coverage over the past nine months. We have a dedicated um, page on our website, homeless.desertsun.com, where we've collected all of Nicole's reporting. Um, we have articles that she's reported. Uh, we have question and answers where we've responded to questions from the public uh, about all kinds of aspects of this problem. Uh, we've gone deep. Nicole followed a whole community of 60 people who were evicted from some Caltrans land in Coachella and followed them over many months to find out whether they actually got housing or not. And it's a really interesting story about why some people did and why some people did not. And then another story that she did, uh, just published very recently, was um, she actually designed her own survey and went out and interviewed 200 <clears throat> homeless people about their health care and their access to health care and published the results of that. And this is really hard on the ground work, going out, finding homeless people, winning their trust, getting them to talk to you for 20 minutes about their personal health situations. Um, I just want to emphasize um, how much I respect Nicole for <laughs> really pounding the pavement in that way. Um, so if you haven't seen this uh, coverage, I really encourage you to check it out. And then Nicole, just talk a little bit about the program on May 30th. Uh, so we have four speakers that night and a resource fair. So um, the resource fair beforehand and afterwards will give people a chance to talk um, and learn about the different resources we have in our community. If you are homeless or if you want to volunteer, I get a lot of emails of people asking how they can give back and get involved, which I think is really great. And this is like a great opportunity. Everything's in one place. You can talk to people um yourselves to figure out what works for you and then the actual storytelling event uh, is what i'm most excited about we have four people i'll be talking about how we do journalism and how we've shifted um in our newsroom to cover this topic in a new way uh, and then we have three really great speakers who uh, have experienced homelessness each of their stories looks very very different um, and it gives an insight, some about the struggles with the housing process. Um, some stories show how close everyone can be to homelessness. Uh, Greg Rodriguez from Manny Perez's office will be one of our speakers. Uh, he does a lot of work with homeless policy in the county, but he also has his own personal story of homelessness um, and is such an ordinary story, and that's why it's so powerful is it really drives home the fact that it could be anyone. And then um, we have a woman who's a caseworker at Martha's Village who was at Martha's because uh, she was living there during high school because her family went through a rough patch and she wanted to give back. So she became a caseworker, went back to Martha's um, and is helping people go through the process she went through. And our last speaker um, was profiled in one of our previous stories. She was at the Caltrans encampment um, and was successfully housed. But she'll talk about how things like grief and depression, which is so common um, in society, led her to be homeless. So it's a really great insight that I would never be able to write myself, but letting people say it in their own words is very powerful. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you guys for having us, and I hope to see some of you on the 30th. Very good, Julie. You and I are alumnus of the Los Angeles Times. I was there 25 years as an ed director. So oh. uh, I recognize the changes that you have brought to the Desert Sun, and I was gonna send you an email and congratulate you as one newspaper person to another. Great improvements. You're doing a wonderful job. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's have lunch sometime and we'll, reminisce. We'll do war stories. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming today. And I add my thanks also. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, this was presented today because uh, yesterday, uh, both Charlie and I went to a meeting, which was from CBAG, which is the Coachella Valley Association of Governments. And Charlie is the delegate. I am the alternate delegate. And we both have been going to meetings since we've been on the council. 
And it's obviously um, an issue that everyone needs to address and wants to address. Uh, it's a very complicated issue, needless to say. There are so many moving parts, and those parts are always changing. In fact, they change daily. So it's hard to keep up with them, but uh, there were a lot of takeaway points that were given to the audience. There was a lot of discussion. Uh, there was a lot of important and valuable information that was disseminated. And Charlie and I would like to both uh, bring you up to date, uh, bring everyone up to date that might be watching this. And uh, if you have an opportunity, CVAG meetings are held regularly for the homeless and the homeless uh, committee, and if anybody wants to attend, they're open to the public, as I say, and uh, you're always welcome. So, uh, Charlie, would you like to start? Thank you, Mayor. I will. Let me just de um, elaborate a little more on the CVAG, the commission, the Homeless Commission, is represented by each of the nine cities. It also has representatives of all of the support groups that are available to the homeless people and the needy people that are in the Coachella Valley. It's a wonderful commission, and Iris and I have been uh, on it for, I think, over 10 years that we represented it, and have seen it grow to where it is today. So they gave a quarterly update on Riverside County homeless initiatives at this meeting, and uh, Natalie Kamura, who is the Riverside County Homeless Solution representative, gave a few highlights, which I'll try to go through, not all of them, but some of them. Um, there are several points of interest and lots of information given at that meeting, and I'll go through just a very few of them. As you know or may not know, Governor Newsom promised a funding grant, and these funds will flow through the county. He is very, very pro-homeless and addressing this situation in the entire state of California. And if you know or do not know, uh, San Francisco... Uh, has a severe problem. Uh, Los Angeles alone has, at the last count that I remember, 74,000 homeless people on the streets in downtown Los Angeles. So this is a major, major situation that is trying to be corrected and think that he is at the head of it and is very pro to this cause. There are monies that are available for projects, but those funds will not be allocated per region but per project. Very complicated to go into that, as Iris said. It, it's very uh, convoluting to different levels of the services that are offered, but there is money coming in. The big thing is the seven of the nine Coachella Valley cities provided $1.8 million for funding. Rancho Mirage has provided 100000 this year, and that is matched by the uh, state grants, so actually every 100000 that is matched, they give another 100000 which brought that figure to date up to 1800000 Ranch and Mirage also is giving another 65000 that we give to supporting groups like Food Bank, um, Desert Well, and et cetera with that. So we are very, very involve this city in spending your money to support the situation of the homeless and the needy, and I want you to know that. There have been many challenges with the Path of Life program, which has started last year. The program is doing better and is working on an app. There are several cities commending their money and committing their money on being spent for future needed in transparency. A CVAG contract, which provides a 24-7 program also out there for the help and the people that are in need. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Iris. Well, thank you, Charlie. Uh, as Charlie mentioned, um, this was a quarterly update on a Riverside County homelessness initiatives, and the gal who, who uh, was the representative was Natalie Kimura, who was the Riverside County Homelessness Solutions representative. And there was another gentleman, and I think his name was mentioned earlier. He gave an update on Homelessness Collaborative and CV Housing First. And his name was Greg Rodriguez. And he gave a lot of information and uh, just added to all the different points of interest. Uh, as Charlie said, there is money that is available, but it will not be 
uh, allocated per region. It is only allocated per project. Um, the Riverside County's point in time numbers are up, and this may be due to um, the fact that there are more counters that are participating in the counting of the homeless. I know that last year there were a couple of issues with the rain, and some of the people could not um, be contacted, and um, even when they went back the second time, supposedly there was rain on that day also. So a lot of people were not counted, but are being able to be counted now, along with the people who are added to do all this uh, counting and be part of that process. Um, there's something interesting also. Uh, people crossing the border are no longer referred to as illegal aliens. Uh, this was information that was given and very strongly yesterday. Uh, they're no longer illegal aliens, but they are legal asylum seekers. So this is the new uh, phrase that is given to them, the new name. Uh, in the city of Blythe, asylum seekers are taking funds from the homeless population. And this was something that was mentioned a couple times yesterday. And for the last few months, something that most people don't know about, asylum seekers have been dropped off in the cities of Blythe and Coachella. Uh, being dropped off means that they are taken either to a bus stop or they are taking, being taken to one of the participating churches. Uh, the drop-off places are now located in the East Valley, but it is anticipated that the dropping off will be proceeding to the West Valley in the very near future. And Darla from Martha's Kitchen and Village reported that 74 people had come to their facility because when patients are released from hospitals, they are no longer allowed to be dropped off on the street, but need to be taken to a facility. Um, the county representatives also gave updates on encampments. And uh, one of the big problems with the encampments, if they are located in flood areas, is that they are, needless to say, a major problem. And with the rains that we had last year, um, it was a lot of focus that needed to be focused on them and rescuing them. There's a lot of funding that is required for the cleanup process effort. And one thing that was also stressed strongly is that encampments are not going away. Um, there are senior needs, there are children's needs, there are medical needs, there are pet needs, there are mental issue needs, and there is a minimum, fortunately, of two, 72 hours that is required to be given to all the encampments when there is a cleaning process that is going to be re taking place. So when interviewing the homeless, there were a variety of different reasons given for their homelessness, and those Reasons range from drug problems, medical expenses, not wanting to be accountable, and many are heavily in debt with fines from legal issues on their own. The overall feeling, though, from the homeless seems to be that they cannot see a way out of their problems. Uh, several of the issues of the homelessness agencies are dealing with are the fact that there are 17 different departments working on solutions. And their thoughts and their intentions is that they feel that better communication is needed, along with cross-training, and that not enough resources coordinating the efforts and assessing situations is available. And one of the big issues also that we have to be very mindful of is that when dealing with the hom homeless, civil rights laws need to be followed. So everyone is being extra careful, everyone is being extra compassionate, everyone is being con considered as possible not to do anything or say anything that would be hurtful, but to be able to give aid wherever possible and to uh, direct uh, the people who want to be directed to the agencies that might help them lead a, a, a new life and uh, give them a fresh start. So thank you very much. And thank you ladies for coming and bringing this to our attention. 
And uh, I wish you all the best with all your future reporting because it is, as you say, something that affects all of us. And um, we hopefully will be looking toward uh, some great progress and some solutions and uh, that will spread across the country. Thank you again. Uh, okay. Madam Mayor, just to add uh, one thing to that is, I think anytime we talk about homelessness, it's important to recognize the role that the Desert Healthcare District has been playing locally here in the Valley. Uh, so they're the ones matching uh, all of our funds uh, for the CV Housing First program. And so they're about half the funding that we have out here towards uh, these initiatives. And uh, they also funded the Barbara Poppy report, which was a really fact-based mm -hmm. uh, review of uh, game plan. How do you start to address this very serious situation at a local level? And uh, Nicole, it's been great working with you. It's been great reading your articles. And I think uh, what you do adds a ton of value. And it, uh, you know, you're a person that's getting involved. You're going out on the streets and you're doing the interviews and you're trying to educate people on this topic, which I think is very important. So thanks for being here today and thank you for what you're doing for the Valley. Thank you. Thank you, Isaiah. And thank you, uh, Charlie. All right, moving on now to another presenter and that is someone from Palm Springs. And uh, it's the Palm Springs Power. And uh, this is going to be uh, someone who you will probably want to uh, guess who's behind the uh, the mask, but it's Andrew Starkey, who's coming up to the microphone, and uh, we thank you for coming, and we look forward to your baseball game. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you all very much for allowing us to be here today. My name is Andrew Starkey. I'm the president of the Palm Springs Power. We are the hometown baseball team here in the Coachella Valley. We might play down in Palm Springs at Palm Springs Stadium, but we are the hometown team, and this is the heart of the Coachella Valley. And I wanted to make sure everyone here in the city and all of our residents know that on Tuesday, June 4th, we are having City of Rancho Mirage Night at a power baseball game. The game time will be 7 p.m. with the gates opening at 6 p.m. I know that uh, several people have come out of the Coachella Valley as local athletes playing for our organization, but recently I've been contacted by one athlete uh, who's wanted to try out for our team, distinguished council member Weil, and uh, I think that night might be a great evening for him to try out with a first pitch uh, before the game, and hopefully uh, he can get it warmed up. And Thank you. I've been practicing for weeks. Thank you very much. That sounds like a motion. Is there a second? Yeah. I'll second that. <laughs> But I am joined here by our uh, beloved mascot, Rocky the Ram. The tickets for all of the uh, residents can be picked up here at City Hall or on game night at the stadium at our box office. They're all inclusive tickets with ballpark fare, hot dog, soda, admission. It'll be a great evening of good family, hometown fun. Hopefully all of you, your family, your friends, and all of our residents here in Rancho Mirage are able to join us uh, at Palm Springs Stadium for a power baseball game. Thank you, and, and I know a lot of us were there last year. We had a great time, you have great hot dogs, and it was fun to cheer the team and, uh, and be a part of it. So thank you so much and uh, good luck. Great, we Very will be much. there. You're gonna be there. Absolutely, wouldn't miss it. You heard <laughs> New it reason first. to come if you weren't coming before. All the more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and moving on to our last presenter at this time is Katie Stice, and she is the new uh, executive director of our wonderful chamber. She's now giving, she's giving uh, fist greetings uh, to the Ram and uh, to the, the, the baseball team with good wishes. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, Madam Mayor, City Council, um, city staff and guests here today. My name is Katie Stice, your executive director for the Ranch and Mirage Chamber of Commerce. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for participating in our recent Desert Nurses Appreciation Luncheon and wanted to take you through that fabulous event. It was my first event. And I think we have a little presentation that'll be coming on shortly. Perfect. So this event saw 200 attendees this year Full house at the beautiful Mission Hills Country Club. So lucky to be there with the beautiful views, staff, and meal. All of our sponsors there 
were so thrilled to be involved, and it was part of uh, what I was tasked with, which is bringing in more sponsors, more involvement, and more people to be included in this wonderful event. Now, having been through it, through it for the first time, I can really see it just growing and expanding. Our MC that day was Brooke Berry from News Channel 3 and Channel 2. She did a fantastic job and also told some of her own stories um, uh, related to the medical industry. And what's really great as well about having newscasters come and um, be our MCs for the event is they also bring the news along with them to cover the event and do interviews as well, which they played later that night and the next morning. Some of our, our honorees from College of the Desert, we do give away a $1,000 scholarship each year. This was given to Emily Gillian um, as Outstanding Student Nurse of the Year. Um, we will be looking to increase that scholarship. Um, we don't think that $1,000 is quite enough knowing their expenses at hand. So next year you can look to see us um, inviting any attendees or sponsors to add to that sponsorship and increase that. Next, from the California Nurses Educational Institute Outstanding Nurse Award. This was really special. If you were there, you saw a lot of tears and excitement. It was a surprise award for Edwina Dirk. She's been, she's an RN, and she's been uh, a nurse for 29 years, I believe, here in the Coachella Valley. It was wonderful to see. Next, from Desert Care Network, this was from Desert Regional Medical Center, Nurse of the Year, Marissa. I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, but as you can see by all the letters after her name, she is quite an accomplished nurse. The nurses at our local hospitals rise to the top um, with a, uh, teams over six, sometimes 750 nurses. So to win the Nurse of the Year is quite the accomplishment. Next from JFK, Nurse of the Year, was Kathy Ruwakava. Uh, one of the special stories that um, Council Member Weil and I were just talking about was she had just won previously the year before the Outstanding Nursing Student of the Year. Quite a special story. Eisenhower, Nurse of the Year, is Rogalie Velasco. Fantastic nurse. Humanitarian Award went to UCR Health Medicine Street Program, and the presenter was our own Madam Mayor. Thank you so much for being there. And just some photos of attendees. Of course, we had our ambassador team there in full force working really hard. Some VIPs were caught in the crowd. There are some more of our VIPs. Of course, the uh, whole community comes out in support of our uh, medical and healthcare industry. And uh, also a few of our um, restaurateurs sponsored a table for our local police officers. And last but not least, we just wanna say thank you and extend a heartfelt thanks to the city for their presenting sponsorship, their involvement and their support to the chamber. We have a lot of momentum, the partnership is strong and we just wanna say thank you so much. A few things to look forward to, we do have a Bernie's Mixer coming up with Palm Springs Chamber of Commerce. We'll be working with Mary Lou Suderman on that disaster preparedness program that they were talking about, making sure businesses are attending that. We'll be at the Palm Springs Power Game and probably everywhere else that you can possibly think of. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Do you have any questions? Yes, Katie, let me say I'm sorry I couldn't attend. I missed you. But I, I missed it, and I heard it was fabulous. The other thing is, being a part of that chamber for over 20 years on the board and as chairman, to see what you have done in such a short window is absolutely mind-blowing. Congratulations to you, your board. Wonderful. And we are so proud of you and Thank everything you. you're doing. Your words mean a lot. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank Any you. Any other comments? Well, I, I have to echo what Charlie said because it was a beautiful and meaningful and, and very uh, emotional mm -hmm. experience to see all these people up there and the lives that they are going to be starting. And uh, with your help and uh, with all the, the funds that you're able to provide, uh, it's, it's a delight just to see what you have done Thank and you. in such a short time and we look forward to having you up here all the time giving updates showing pictures and telling us all your success stories thank you thank you so much i absolutely will thank, thank you. you all right take care okay the next to speak will be alan worthy
Well, good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, you know, there's so many great things to cover, like this homeless situation. And when you guys had that meeting here a couple of weeks ago, uh, then it went over to my Zell, where the woman, Jessica, came in raving about all of you. So I wanted to give you that great review and how courteous and attentive you were, and especially you, Mr. Hobart, got a special mention. I said, that's who they are. Sometimes, sometimes they get a bad rap. They don't deserve it. It's, you know, you guys are great, and thank you. Um, so I'm going to address this sort of kind of where I left off two weeks ago. And this is the declaration that was filed against me from Eisenhower. This dates back like a year ago, and there have been two motions since then. Uh, I want to clear this up with Ms. Kaiser, Director of Risk Management. You know, I am very sorry that you feel the way you do, and I'm here today to say that it's not true. But your third-party attorneys, the second group, uh, have made the grave mistake of usurping those hearings. They've done it through perjury, and they've done it through misrepresenting my proof of service, which, of course, I can prove. So that's not okay. But so the end result in all three of these hearings, there's not been a hearing. So I'm going to clear this up today on the first one. Uh, Ms. Kaiser states, you state that, uh, well, I think it's obvious that you've not hand, uh, dealt with protocol or I would not be here today. Uh, you state that I specifically name you as someone who is violating the law, whereas I just said you are violating the law. And you did so with the letter of 315.13, both civilly and felonious. Uh, you state that I say you should be investigated. I take no pleasure in anyone being investigated, but like most of you, I ran to the poll uh, and voted for that three strikes, you're out law. And ma'am, you're beyond the three strikes, you're out. You've turned me into, in Palm Springs, with the crime and corruption there, a one-man police department, and over here or wherever, you know, a priest or a shrink where you have to turn you in after a while. And I have had to do that. And you state, I've said you could be arrested. Well, if you read the federal law, it states that you can be arrested. And that's why we really don't want to go down the road here. Uh, you state that I say you thwarted an investigation. Well, you certainly did for all the aforementioned reasons. At this hour, I'm trying to get my condo back. And you have thrown the Palm Desert Sheriff Station and the DA's office into a tailspin with shutting me down. You also say that I, you prevented me from being in contact with the hospital. Well, you certainly did with that letter. Uh, you say my behavior is threatening to you. Uh, at no time, ma'am, have I been a threat to you. I've said not, nothing or done nothing that could be misconstrued as threatening to you. You further state, and in closing, that I have been walking around the Eisenhower campus. I have done no such thing. And a more recent letter, you have stated I am calling there. And in this, in fact, perjured statement and subordinated perjury, you state the same thing. It is absolutely not true. And in closing, closing, you have implicated a sheriff deputy at the Palm Springs Courthouse. God forbid. Let's not go here. I would have to subpoena her. She is not happy about it because what you said that went on between me and her or, and or the judge never happened. And that deputy will testify to that effect. So let's get on with it for everyone's sake and make the settlement to me and my family. It's long overdue, and especially with the standing that I have with Nationwide. And let's move on. We have had a horror here since the first of the year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's move on. Thank you. Okay, the next one to speak is Brad Anderson. Hello, thank you, Brad Anderson, City of Ransom Mirage, Ferber Drive. Uh, I wanted to mention uh, a few things. Uh, just one of them really quick. Uh, I noticed uh, when I came in today, I, I spoke at another meeting, I noticed this little flyer up there on the, in the city hall area. And the reason I bring that up is because I, I addressed the council before, these people happen to be my neighbors. And they run a home-based business out of my home business, out of their house. But uh, I was encouraged, because I kind of gave up uh, fighting that. But uh, 
I would hope that maybe you could uh, address that and supply uh, room for other businesses in, in the city to uh, also put their flyers up there too. Uh, the, uh, so that way everybody can benefit. Uh, but uh, anyway, I wanted to talk about the Mosquito Vector Control District again real quick. Uh, you're probably aware that they're going to do some aerial spraying in the city of Coachella and down at Thermo area in Indio. And knowing the areas that they're going to spray, and uh, I, I can't emphasize enough that, uh, that uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> got sidetracked there. Uh, in the Sarpen Sea area, last at the beginning of May, they did some aerial spraying down there, and that was unnecessary, just like the Indio stuff is now. Uh, the The mosquito counts are really high this year, and and they say it's because of rain, and it's more likely because of the lack of rain. Uh, before the water shortage, this is my uh, determination is. And we used to flush these catch basins out quite often with people irrigating water, and, and now we don't do that, so the water sits longer. Uh, so that's my theory, and that's why it's uh, increasing like it is, or one of the reasons. And and I just want to emphasize that the Mosquito District is not larviciding like they should, uh, and I think it's just a lack of attention to it. Um, I know the uh, general manager, Mr. Witte, stated that he was impressed at, or trying to impress upon the counselor, uh, the, the vector counselor, on how fast that they learned of this and how, how they acted so quickly. But again, they did act quickly. It took over a week now, and they're gonna do some applications this week. So it took just as long as it normally would. And uh, so, not to shadow that, I'm, I'm jumping all over the place, but when they when they had this stuff down in in Mecca area, what they're doing they're pulling technicians that work in all the cities in in the county here or around in the Coachella Valley. So your services are going down. The other city services are going down. So that's why Indio is like it is, and that's why uh, Coachella is uh, having a high count too. And I and I and I know around my house I'm okay, but. Uh, because I monitor that. So if you live next to me, you're lucky. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, the next to speak is uh, Mr. Bali Melendez. Uh, good afternoon, uh, City Council of Mount um, <coughs> Ranch. I'm so happy to see you. I'm going to uh, take up my three minutes. I wouldn't miss my three minutes of limelight. So, as I have mentioned many times, <clears throat> one of my pet uh, uh, subjects that I'm sticking to uh, nowadays is the higher education in the form of a bachelor's degree and uh, uh, what I understand about California that um, uh, what they call or what California calls a university. In Texas, uh, well, I've lived all over, but I'm originally from Texas. <clears throat> It's a little bit different, a college's bachelor's degree, but out here I keep hearing university is bachelor's degree. <clears throat> so I have, uh, this is a very big interest of mine. I, I take courses at the college at COD. And last, uh, Last semester, I took business law. This semester, I'm taking uh, financial uh, ac <clears throat> accounting. And this is what I notice. When I, uh, well, I have to notice. I think I'm the oldest guy that goes to COD. So what do I see? I see a bunch of high schoolers. I mean, really young people and really smart, and they're really good with their 
with their gadgets, electronic gadgets. But there are certain things I don't like about them. I don't like them, these youngsters, to be indoctrinated the way they are. And this comes from their high school years, of course. But it seems to me, and I know this is the wrong crowd to be telling, but tomorrow I'm going to be saying the same thing to, to the um, uh, college trustees. <clears throat> the mindset, the mentality of this high school is this indoctrination of, 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 of not questioning their indoctrination. And I just have 14 seconds left. And I like the idea of CBAG, and I like for all these nine cities to be working together and not to send our really good talent that's going to fix our teeth and our eyes and so on to leave the valley, but to stay here and, and, and take care of the older folks like us. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Well, this is the Mr. Melendez who had the last card that was filled out. If there's anyone who would like to speak and did not have a chance to fill out a card, you are welcome to come to the podium. Anyone? All right. Seeing none, uh, this portion of our agenda will now be closed, and we will move on to uh, City Council Board member comments. And I will start with Charlie. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I will say that I had the pleasure last weekend to attend the California Preservation Foundation's uh, get together in Palm Springs about uh, preservation of historical sites throughout the Coachella Valley. And I sat on that board and it was their 44th annual California Preservation Conference, which as I said, is a uh, preservation group that looks into making sure that we here in the Coachella Valley preserve our history in our architectural history and future of what is available and what is not to be destroyed. So with that, the main focus of this meeting was the panel discussion will be on the subject of country club histories and preservation issues. And this was the discussion that we had, what is the future? for country clubs, not only in the Coachella Valley, but in the United States, all the way across Arizona. What, where are they going? What is the future? What are, what are the things that are taking place? It was very interesting, and I had the opportunity, as I said, to answer questions on the preservation issues and what is happening with our 10 uh, golf courses and homes that we have in uh, Rancho Mirage. So we are also going to be a part in the uh, 1920 season for the um, historical preservation uh, program, which will be coming up in February. This will be our third year. And I will also say that thanks to my council members and staff, that we are really looking forward to the history that we have here in Rancho Mirage, which is just as equal, in my opinion, to what is in Palm Springs. Our history goes further than not only buildings, but in the celebrities and the presidents that have lived here and built their homes and made Rancho Mirage one of the leaders. And the first, the first golf course that was built here was in Rancho Mirage with the homes. So the homes and the golf course is built as a unit, and that was Thunderbird. And that's where our Thunderbird car came from, which was built by one of the executives of the Ford Motor Company. So I'm very pleased with that and to be a part of it. And again, uh, looking forward to what we're going to be doing this year and the programs. Gabe, I'm sure you'll be a part of this also uh, with everything coming up. And uh, we'll keep you in tune. And thank you. Well, thank you, Charlie. That was a lot of interesting information. Well, it just came off the top of my head because I wasn't going to talk about it. I there know, you go. but well, I'm glad I always, you... I, I've never lost for words. Well, I'm glad you did, especially thank learning you. about the Thunderbird and yeah. how it uh, came into being. It is. Thank you. Sure. All right, moving on to Dana. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Madam Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> this past September, the City Council was faced with making a decision to reject or enter into a lease agreement with AT&T 
whereby they would construct a 5G cell tower that would be 60 feet in height and located adjacent to the western edge of the Weston property. At this location, the presence of such a structure immediately adjacent to a number of Mission Hills residents caused the residents serious concern regarding the impact on both viewshed interference and negative impact on home values. The residents in those homes were particularly upset that this huge structure would significantly interfere with their quality of life. Everyone agreed that a cell tower was badly needed in the northern region of our city. Indeed, the gap of cell coverage in that portion of the city has had a huge negative impact for both business and residential interests for several years. To address that issue, the council and the Weston Hotel had previously approved placement of 4G and 5G sites on Weston property, but each time we approved their request, AT&T chose not to construct it. It was and has been a frustrating experience for everyone. As much as we wanted a new tower located in the region of the wall separating the Weston and Mission Hills homes, we were faced with the responsibility of protecting our residents whose view sheds would be significantly impacted by such a huge edifice. Therefore, at our September 2018 council meeting, the council chose to reject the site selected by AT&T, a site we deemed too close to residential homes, a site that would clearly be a negative presence which would interfere with the enjoyment of one's home. This was and is an important element in what we believe any city council should consider in such circumstances where we faced such a Hobson's choice. We believed we could find a middle ground that worked well for everyone. The council then approved a modification in the location of such a tower. We approved a location that was about 400 feet from the nearest Mission Hill residence. With AT&T's history of getting permits but not actually building the towers, the council had approved the towers that council prior councils had approved. The council chose to further motivate AT&T to actually construct this tower at this modified location. The council added a bonus of $20,000 if the project was fully completed within one year from our date of approval. AT&T has now withdrawn their lawsuit against the city, which I might add they would have lost, and has just conveyed to our building department that they now plan on pulling permits next week and that they want to start construction on June 1st. We will keep the public informed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Moving on to uh, Council Member Kite. Thank you, Mayor. I want to take a moment today to remind everyone of a very special upcoming event. A couple of times a year, we take time to thank the brave men and women who protect our city. This Wednesday, May 29th, from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., the Riverside County Sheriff's Department in the city of Rancho Mirage will host Coffee with a Cop. The public is invited to join Rancho Mirage police officers at Krispy Kreme. Now, could you find a better spot <laughs> than Krispy Kreme to have a donut event? There, for those of you who haven't been there yet, they're located at 72787 Dinah Shore, in Rancho Mirage. They're near the Rancho 13 theaters. This is a chance for you to meet the local officers and learn about their work in the community, discuss community issues, 
and build relationships over a cup of joe. Coffee with a cop is a national incentive supported by the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, and aims to advance the practice of community policing through improving relationships between law enforcement and community members, one cup of coffee at a time. So we hope to see you there again. That is this Wednesday, 8 a.m. at Krispy Kreme and Rancho Mirage. See you there, Mayor. You certainly will see me there. Thank you so much. I just put it down on my calendar, and uh, I was told by an excellent source that when your Krispy Kreme uh, glazed donuts cool off, all you need to do is put them in your microwave for six seconds, and you're back to uh, hot off the griddle. So we'll look forward to being there, and thank you for your message. Ted? Thank you, Iris. <clears throat> Education is an important part of our society. It is often the key to building a better life. Many important roles in our city, such as engineers, accountants, doctors, educators, are among those required to obtain advanced education. But this endeavor can often be cost prohibitive for many, limiting our youth. Our city is a proud supporter of education, and we are fortunate to be able to provide a bridge to the better lives for students. Annually, we provide two scholarships to gifted students at the Rancho Mirage High School. These funds relieve some of the burdens to the selected individuals. This last Monday evening, I had the great privilege of awarding two exemplary students. The recipients, Ms. Sal Saljada Un Parker and Mr. Tyler Ramil, have both received fantastic marks throughout high school, participating in extracurricular curricular activities, and have both truly earned this gift. We are fortunate to live in this amazing city that has the means and the opportunity to recognize gifted and exceptional students. How fortunate we are and how important it is in today's society to have a college education and to have the advantage that some of these students have. And again, I think our city, our city is indicative of giving back to, to society. Uh, and that's what I had the privilege of doing this past uh, Monday. The one other aspect, solar energy is today's resource for a brighter tomorrow. Again, one of the things that we did here at the city is created a Rancho Mirage Energy Authority. And that authority will be hosting a community-focused solar seminar free to the public. Please join experts from the industry to discuss best practices related to energy efficiency, the state of the solar energy industry, opportunities in solar energy, and how to effectively address challenges. Additional discussion topics include electricity rate structures, and battery storage. There will be a le lengthy Q&A session to answer any of your solar-related questions. The seminar will be held on Wednesday, May 9th, 29th. That's Wednesday, May 29th, at the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory in the community room. The seminar begins at 10 a.m. and will be approximately 90 minutes long. An email will be sent tomorrow with details to register for this seminar. Or, obviously, you can just show up. We hope to see you there on May 29th. And those of you that are already members of RMEA, uh, you are recognizing the savings that are being passed on to you 
as a result of being members of the Energy Authority. Uh, the program is working out exceedingly well. And again, it's another example of what the city has done, something that they didn't have to do. We're not compelled to get into the energy business, but we are compelled to do the very best for our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. All right, moving on to uh, my presentation. Uh, the fourth annual Veterans University was held at the Weston Hotel here in Rancho Mirage on Saturday, May 4th. This wonderful event hosted by Congressman Raul Ruiz provided veterans and their families an opportunity to see the many centers and resources available to them. And the purpose of this annual event is to provide a centralized location for information on the many resources available for helping homeless veterans, helping those veterans wanting to start a business or purchase a home, helping those suffering from PTSD, anxiety, or a physical ailment, and provide the resources for helping the families of the veterans with their particular needs. As you can see on the screen, a variety of veterans organizations were there to lend assistance and answer questions. It was truly a remarkable event, and I want to express my thanks and kudos to all those participating in the event. But above all, I want to express my sincerest gratitude to all who have served America and its people through the decades. Freedom, as we all know, is not free. And we treasure the freedoms these dedicated, courageous warriors have so valiantly give, given us. And so for any veteran or family member of a veteran who needs assistance, you, all you have to do is look to the many resources available. Congressman Ruiz has a website dedicated to helping veterans, but there are also many other resources online that are available. So please, whatever your needs are, do not hesitate to ask for help. Seek out the help and contact information on the website. Thank you again to all of you for all your uh, participation, your help, and warmest wishes to you all, too. Thank you. All right. Now moving on to uh, city manager comments from Isaiah Hagerman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, members of the council, uh, at our last council meeting, we had a uh, resident speak about a concern regarding a palm tree that was uh, removed on uh, her HOA property uh, by the HOA. Uh, the city did issue uh, a permit to remove that palm tree for health and safety reasons. And can we pull up the picture? So I just wanted to share with the council, this was the palm tree that was removed uh, for the obvious reason. Uh, it is and will be replaced uh, by the HOA, uh, but because of the lien here and the uh, threat to public health, it was removed, and now it is the HOA's responsibility to replace that palm tree, which they will be doing. Uh, and I just wanted to update the council on that. Uh, Jeremy and his uh, department did follow up with the resident immediately after the meeting, provided her a copy of these pictures with the same information right after the meeting to address her concern. Uh, the second comment I have for the council is uh, just to report uh, that council member Kite and I attended the California League of Cities Riverside Division meeting uh, this past Monday on May 13th. And there were a, a variety of bills uh, that are working their way through the state right now. And uh, we were provided an update on uh, many pending bills, a lot having to do with housing, homelessness, uh, and it was uh, a good meeting. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we'll move on to uh, the minutes. And if I can have a motion and a second, if there are no corrections or additions. I'll make a motion one through five to accept. OK, and I have a second. second. OK, uh, we have a motion and a second. So please vote. Motion carries five zero. Thank you, Christy. And moving on now to our consent calendar, and this is going to be handled by our city manager, Isaiah Hagerman. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. You have seven items on your consent calendar today for your consideration. 
Item number one is to waive the full reading of all ordinances introduced or adopted pursuant to this agenda. Item number two is the second reading and adoption of ordinance number 1151, amending chapter 3.34 of the public works contracts of title three revenue and finance of the Rancher Mirage, Rancher Mirage Municipal Code. Item number three is the second reading and adoption of ordinance number 1152. This is uh, changing the CPI factor for community facilities district number two from the Los Angeles, Riverside, Orange County area to the uh, new and updated Riverside slash San Bernardino, Ontario area. Item number four is approval of final track map number 36809-4. This is the uh, next track map in the Dell Web project. Item number five is the final acceptance of the low water crossing emergency repairs that were conducted on Frank Sinatra Drive and Country Club Drive at the Whitewater Wash Channel crossings. Item number six are demands. You have one, uh, I'm sorry, item number six are contracts. You have one contract for our library and item number seven are demands and staff is here to answer any questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Questions from council? Yeah, could I pull number three? I just have a question or two to ask him. All right, we're going to be pulling number three. I move approval of the consent calendar minus the one item. For I'll second review. that. Okay, please vote. Okay. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you so much. And now, uh, item number three. Um, Isaiah, uh, first off, this is a mandatory change imposed on us. Isn't that correct? Yes. And the other question is, um, could you, I'm looking back, I'm looking on page 3-1, uh, could you look at the past, uh, for example, three years or some period of time that you'd like to pick? What are the differences in the numbers uh, that are caused by this change? Is it cost the city more? Is it cost the city less? What? Or maybe you should, we should put it over on. Well, so uh, what prompted this change is a, a new CPI factor. So they didn't track this three years ago. So three years from now, we will have the data to answer that question. So really what we're looking at is in the future. Um, and simply what this does is it just realigns the CPI factor with our local area. Uh, so what prompted the change is the creation of this new CPI factor. So there is no history. I can't compare it for the last three years because it is a new factor. Is, is this something you can guess at or you really need to? I'm just curious, is it going to be a little higher for us, uh, interest rates or a little lower? Uh, do, you, do you have a feeling, anything on that? And if you don't, you don't. Uh, no, I think it'll be uh, somewhat consistent with what it was before. And uh, CFD number two is uh, for the Weston timeshares and this money goes to our library. Uh, annually, it's a little over 200,000 a year. So a CPI factor on that, what the difference is gonna be will be a very minor result to the city. Thank so you. We, we don't have a big concern at a staff level that this is gonna result in a much lower fee for our library. We think it'll be consistent and this is more reflective of our area as well. Thank you. Okay, so now maybe- I move that we- uh, Accept and pass uh, item number three. I'll, I'll second, second it. it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Okay. Motion carries 5-0. Okay, and now we'll move on to the action calendar. And this is starting with item number eight. And this is going to be handled by Jesse Eckenroth, our public works director. And the subject matter is fiscal year 2019-2020, levy of assessments for landscaping and lighting maintenance district number 87-01. Thank you, Jesse. Madam Mayor, City Council. Uh, the city has five special event benefit zones born from development agreements between the property developer and the city and one citywide median zone under landscape and lighting district 8701. The districts exist for the purpose of maintaining landscaping and lighting in each specific zone. The zones within the district are assessed on a cost recovery basis, assessing parcel owners for the associated maintenance costs of the specific zone. 
The citywide landscape and lighting zone, which covers the city medians, is assessed to parcel owners citywide, and the five special benefit zones are assessed only to the parcels receiving the direct and special benefit. To determine whether assessments need to be revised, the city contracts with Wildan Financial Services to prepare an engineer's annual levy report. The engineer's annual levy report factors the revenues and expenses associated uh, with each zone and provides a cost recovery estimate for each zone. The recommendations in the attached engineer's report are based on cost recovery. Today's motions do not constitute a final approval. They simply initiate the levy proceedings. A final approval is scheduled for the June 6th City Council meeting. <clears throat> a public notice will be issued in the local paper noticing the June 6th meeting. Um, and a public hearing will be conducted at the June 6th meeting, allowing residents the opportunity to speak on the proposed assessments. Staff is recommending that the City Council approve the three resolutions that are attached to the staff report. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Madam Mayor, I have yes. a question. Okay. Jesse, um, excellent report. I, in looking at the various charges for the various zones, is there something unique about Zone A? where we were up this year in, in cost while the other zones were all down? I think it's pretty typical to have an uptick in cost. The fact that we have a couple zones that are down in cost is uh, attributable to, I think, our, lounge, our landscape groundskeepers uh, keeping a very good eye on those zones. And we haven't had any unexpected repairs come out of most of the zones. So, um, we've actually had a decrease in most of these zones, which is unusual. So the fact that zone A is ticking up a little bit is more standard. It just looks out of the norm because the other zones are ticking down a little bit because we've kept a good watch on them and we haven't had any unexpected uh, waterline breaks or diseases to the trees. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Nope. All right. Any other questions or comments from the audience? <clears throat> Seeing none, I will close the public comment uh, segment and ask for a motion and a second. All right, I will do the motion of the City Council. A, adopt resolution number 2019 next in order. Initiating procedures for the annual levy of assessments, assessments for the Ranch Mirage Consolidation, Landscaping and Lighting Maintenance Assessment District number 87-01 for fiscal year 2019-20B, adopt resolution number 2019, next in order declaring its intentions to levy annual assessments for the Rancho Mirage Consolidated Landscaping and Lighting Maintenance Assessment District number 87-01 for fiscal year 2019-20 and C, adopt resolution number 2019, next in order for Preliminary approval of the engineer's annual levy report for the Rancho Mirage Consolidation Landscaping and Lighting Maintenance Assessment District Number 8701 for fiscal year 2019-20. Thank you. May I have a second? Second that. Okay. We have a motion to second. Please vote. It's getting quick. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Christy. All right, moving on to item number nine, and this is going to be handled by Isaiah Hagerman, our city manager, and it's regarding Historic Preservation Commission. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the council has uh, two items for consideration uh, under this report. Uh, the first one is an ordinance, the second one is a resolution, and they both relate to the Historic Preservation Commission. With this commission, uh, staff identified uh, a, uh, a necessary change to the commission. Uh, currently, this commission only has uh, three commissioners, and uh, most commissions are at five. And so what we're doing is item number A, the ordinance. This commission happened to be mentioned in the municipal code. And uh, upon research, staff can really find a basis for that commission being in our municipal code. And the standard practice is that our commissions are governed by a resolution. So since we were seeking to do changes to this commission to increase the number of commissioners from three to five, uh, we also thought it would be uh, prudent, since we're already going to have to make a change, to remove this commission from the municipal code. So that's what item A does. That's what the ordinance does, is it will remove this commission from our municipal code. 
Item B, the resolution, then reestablishes this commission via resolution. And then that way in the future, if there's ever changes to the scope or number of commissioners, we're not amending our municipal code, we are amending a resolution. And that is, again, consistent practice with what we do with our other commissions. So we're just trying to bring this commission in line with uh, how we treat our other commissions. So what item A will do is remove the commission from our municipal code. Item B will reestablish the commission via resolution. And again, the resolution proposes to increase this commission from the current three members to five. Each council member will have one appointee. Those appointees are uh, approved by a majority of the council. Uh, in addition, any single council member at any time uh, can remove his or her appointment. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Are there any questions? Yes, I will just give a, a point of reference that the commission, when it was reformed to three, it was also as needed. And we are going to change it now because of the interest in what is happening in the Coachella Valley and with the historic uh, preservation move that we do this as an every other month. Okay. So. Thank you. All right, uh, any comments, member here? In, a, in addition to what Charlie just said about the, the history of the Historic Commission, it uh, was actually decreased in size because nobody had any interest in it. And we had, <laughs> we had a tough time finding three people that actually wanted to be part of the commission. The whole situation has changed dramatically now where there's a lot of interest out there and I think increasing the number of Commissioners really make sense. Thank, thank you, Richard. And there are a lot of subjects that are that are coming up, which we, which will come to your attention, including uh, Thunderbird and the cottages uh, there too with which they are thinking of making a move to uh, tear them down and build a new ones. So there, there's a big uh, issue that will be coming to us, and I'm trying to get that. Uh, presentation to you guys so that you can see the yin and the yang of those that are for it and the reason that those are against it. So this is another reason to bring this up to a five. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, Ted. And I think the other point being is that uh, it's uh, proper to put this commission in line with all the other commissions, uh, having one appointment per council member. Uh, that's a structure that makes sense. Uh, and uh, is more in keeping with uh, uh, the consistency of all of our commissions. So I think it's uh, worthwhile to do. And with, with uh, Charlie's uh, ominous prediction of uh, future excitement on that council or on that committee, I suspect uh, all of a sudden it's going to have a lot of interest. <laughs> There'll be a lot of tadas coming forward. Now, I, I just want to say that also, uh, we have had kind of a reputation, which I resented, that we didn't really care about our heritage, and that is farthest from the truth. And that's why I'm so passionate to know that this city, this council, this staff, and those people out there who have these homes and uh, want to preserve them and uh, restore them, by the way, we're having a big influence uh, of, of new people moving in rather than buying homes in Palm Springs, they are moving to Rancho Mirage because we have better architectural residents. Thank you very much out there. Uh, and uh, we are looking forward to support all that wonderful money coming back into us to redo our houses and for those people to live here and buy goods and services and have dinners in our restaurants. Who wrote that? Just Charlie, do you want to do another head. 10 minutes? <laughs> what? what? <laughs> okay. Uh, I and came up with the idea of a historical... The commission. Oh, I think that was a uh, Dana Hobart certainly, originally. Certainly was prescient. Yes, yes. Visionary. But with an interlude there with a dip <laughs> and back to prescience. I was remiss in, in giving credit where credit was due. Okay. <laughs> there. Well, now you've given credit. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jeremy, is there any chance that you might know how many homes that have been designated so far? Put me on the spot. I know. I didn't mean to. <laughs> a lot of them. There's a lot. 
I think we're 58, up to 58. Yeah, I think 60. we're up to around 60, yeah. maybe just over. Okay. Well, that certainly shows how much we care. We yeah, don't want to sure. let these beauties uh, deteriorate or, or uh, um, and, and recognize them as they should be recognized. Yeah. And many more to come. And many more to come. <laughs> that sounds go. exciting. Okay. And so, Madam Mayor, I'd just like to note that our ordinance, our program is voluntary. Yeah, yes, it is. And, and the other thing, we don't go out banging on doors and saying, fill out these papers and, and register. It, it is at, uh, an at, at will, if you will. We want to know that it's out there, the program is there, and we are pushing that. We are certainly not going out and trying to force people to do something that they don't want to do. But our program is wonderful. It's just in line with a lot of the other cities, and it's an opportunity for those people who have historic um, interest in, in their hearts when they buy these homes to take them one, one step further and make sure that they are there for uh, the long term. Thank you. Sure. All right, so I will open it now to public comments. If anyone wants to ask questions or make comment, please come to the podium. Seeing none, we'll close the public comments and ask for a motion. Well, like do you think I should motion, do that? Madam Mayor. Okay. Move that the City Council introduce ordinance number next in order. First reading, repealing chapter 2.34, Historic Preservation Commission of the Rancho Mirage Municipal Code. And item B, adopt resolution number 2019, next in order, adopting a policy regarding the process for nominating and appointing Historic Preservation Commissioners changing the number of commissions and restating the functions and duties of the Historic Preservation Commission. Now I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Christy. All right, moving on to item number 10. Uh, this is uh, something that's going to be presented by our city clerk, Christy Ramos, and it's an annual appointments to the city boards and commissions. Thank you. Good, after, good afternoon, Madam Mayor and city council members. The city annually seeks volunteers to serve on its boards and commissions. Beginning in late March, the city clerk's office posted a notice inviting applications for the one-year term beginning June 1st. The notices were posted at city hall, at the library, and on the city's website, it was also published twice in a local newspaper. Applications received are on file in my office. Copies of all applications were promptly provided to the city council for review. Each council member provided me with their nominations, which shall be confirmed by, by a majority vote of the council. In a moment, I will read your nominations for all 12 boards and commissions. You may make one motion to confirm the entire slate of appointments. Any nomination requiring Further consideration may be pulled from the slate for separate action. Are there any questions before I read the list of nominations? Okay. okay. No questions from the council? Okay. okay. So first is the Architectural Review Board. Nominations include Dennis Freeman, Sean Lockyer, David Prest, Tom Howell, Lance O'Donnell, Ray Lopez, Narendra Patel, and Paul Sturwald. Next is the Community Cultural Commission. Nominees for this commission are Meredith Jordan, <clears throat> Joyce Virtue, Sally Trademan, Donna Maloof, and Frank Farino. And the city council liaisons to the commission are Councilmember Townsend and Mayor Smotrich. Now I'll read nominees for the largest commission, was the largest commission, Community Emergency Preparedness. Nominees include Robert Brown, Mary Levine, Stan McKenzie, David Richardson, Mary Lou Souter, and the technical advisors are Dr. Dennis Maletti and Dr. Kirk Dandridge. The Community Parks and Trails Commission nominees are Paul Hagel, Dennis Constant, Barry Lynn Freeby, Eric Wright, and Fred Struke. Next is the Historic Preservation Commission. Nominees for this commission are Carol Leibowitz, Stephen Rose, Christian Braun, Craig Tropane, and Ray Keller. Now we'll move on to the Housing Commission. Nominees include Barbara Barrett, Columba Quintero, Michael Pete Paduano, Daryl Mulvihill, Mary Bundy, and Velma Coombs. For the Library and Observatory Advisory Commission, nominees are Ron Treat, Maureen Fife Dunn, Michael Kraft Johnson, 
Lois Reese, Steve Ezer, and the technical advisor is Dennis Steele. The council liaisons to the commission are council member Townsend and mayor pro tem Hobart. Next is library and observatory foundation board and the nominees are Jamie Kabler, Lucy Tagmeyer, Christine Hughes, Leslie Uso, Patrice Merritt, Joe Manhart, Claudette Pays, and Mayor Smotrich also serves on this, this board. For the Mobile Home Fair Practices Commission, nominees are Tom Wheel, Mike Renner, Jason Agostini, David Gray, Diane Lynn, Jerry Burquist, and Stan Markowitz. Next is Planning Commission, and your nominations include Murray Bryant, Suzanne Matthews, Bill Maxwell, Steve Downs, and Sherry Stewart. For speaker series, the nominees are Charlie Barrett, Lynn Mulatto, Michael Davis, Robert Berg, and Sue Cameron. And the city council liaisons are Mayor Pro Tem Hobart and Mayor Smarich. And the final list is for Traffic Safety Commission. Nominations include Sydney Burks, <clears throat> Michael Ziskind, Stephen Shuey, Don Smith, Scott Ventura, Sheriff Sergeant Randy Vasquez, and COPS Captain Bob Schwartz. That completes the list of nominations, and any vacancies remaining will be considered at a future meeting. Thank you, Christy. Any questions or comments from Council? Christy, I have a question regarding the appointment on historic preservation, okay. which, which we just uh, eliminated. Those three people, do they get approved and then they get reelected at some point in the future? This or how do we fill the extra two spots? We just did. We, we had five nominations. So those will be seated and we'll start on June 1st. What was the list I didn't put them in there? It's in a different book. Okay. Is that, is that we, don't, we don't have the list. But it's not on our, it's not in your packet, but. Do you uh, want me to read the nominations for historic preservation again? If you would, please. Yes. That's Carol Leibowitz, Stephen Rose, Christian Braun, Craig Traupain and Ray Keller. And those will fill those positions based upon the change in the ordinance. Correct. And do you show who each one of those people was appointed by? Yes, I show who each of you nominated. So um, Mayor Pro Tem Hobart's nomination was Carol Leibowitz. Council Member Kite was Stephen Rose. Mayor Smotrich was Chris Braun. Council Member Townsend was Craig Traupain. And Council Member Weil was Ray Keller. Okay, hey, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I ask her, uh, who were the nominees for the Library and Observatory Commission or whatever we called it? The Advisory Commission? Yeah. Well, yes. Are there two? Are there two? Yes, there's an advisory commission, and then there's the uh, foundation, which is the 501c3. Okay, on, uh, first on the commission. Okay, so that's... Who was my appointee? Ron Treat. Yeah, okay. Yes. I just didn't hear it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any further questions from the council? Okay. Any questions or comments from the audience? Seeing none. We'll close the audience comments and uh, I'll make the motion um, that uh, the City Council, Housing Authority Board, and Library and Observatory Board appoint applicants to serve on the city's various boards and commissions for a one year term beginning June 1st, 2019. And a second? I'll second that. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries 5 0. And I'd like to uh, congratulate all of the uh, appointees. Uh, I know that you'll all serve well. Some of you are sitting here in the audience. And uh, we look forward to your participation. Thanks very much. Yes, absolutely. You certainly do noble work. We're proud of you. We're proud of the work you do. <clears throat> and we're so thankful that you're willing to serve. Thank you. All right, moving on to item number 11. Strike that. Item number, item number 12. Okay, we're going back to 11. 11. Okay, this is 
oh, this is the outside appointments to the various agencies. And this will be handled also by Christy. And uh, would you? Yes. Take it away. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. So annually following the rotation of mayor, the city council appoints representatives from its membership to serve on various outside agency boards, committees, and commissions. Attached to your staff report is a list of outside agency rep representation consistent with current appointments. If approved as presented, each of you will continue to serve on the same boards, committees, and commissions on which you currently serve in the same position you currently hold. Appointments approved today become effective June 1st, 2019. And that completes my brief report. I'm here to answer any questions. Any questions from council? Nope. Any questions or comments from the audience? Okay, we'll close that portion and move on to a motion in a second. I will make the motion that the city council confirm the annual appointments of city council representatives to various outside agency boards, committees, and commissions as proposed by the mayor. And I'll second that. And that proposal is exhibit to page 11-2? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Did we have a second? I seconded it. Yes. Okay, thank you. And motion carries 5-0. So now we're moving on to item number 12. And this is uh, an item going to be handled by Aaron Espinoza, who is our library director. And this subject is the Hearing Loop Project and Literary Legacy Naming Opportunity. Welcome, Aaron. It's always exciting hearing good news that you bring us. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor city council and city staff. Today I sit before you seeking your approval for the Hearing Loop Project and the addition of the Hearing Loop Project to the Literary Legacy Naming Opportunity. The Library and Observatory is consistently looking for ways to improve our residents and patrons' experience and looking for new opportunities to do so. With all the wonderful programs we hold throughout the year, including lectures, film, music, the Ranch Mirage Writers Festival, and coming soon, more theater programming. We want to ensure our audience has the best audio experience possible. I'd like to share two videos about the hearing loop and their benefits. Oops, sorry about that. This is the sign that means a world of difference for people with hearing loss. That's because any facility that has this sign also has a hearing loop. Hearing loops are widely regarded as the most effective, easiest to use, and most trouble-free assistive listening technology available. While most people with hearing loss have hearing aids, they do little to help them hear clearly in group settings. A hearing loop, however, sends clear, pure sound from a sound system directly to the user's hearing aid without any distortion or background noise. Now, the vast majority of hearing aids, whether old or new, already have what is known as a T-coil or telecoil built in, which just needs to be activated by a hearing professional to use a hearing loop. For example, here's what a typical group presentation sounds like to someone using just a hearing aid. Good morning, everyone. Today, we're offering the following activities. And here's what it sounds like to a hearing aid user with the help of a hearing loop. Good morning, everyone. Today, we're offering the following activities. Unlike other assistive listening systems that require headsets, hearing loops are the only solution that uses the unique tuning to each person's individual pattern of hearing loss and doesn't require any additional equipment. And as you just heard for yourself, the difference is night and day. You can easily find all hearing loop enabled venues near you by downloading the free Loop Finder app for your smartphone or by going to loopfinder.com. So, the next time you see this sign, know that for many, it means experiencing the gift of hearing that makes their ears smile. 
All right, and our second uh, video is going to be a live presentation just to kind of give you an idea of what it is without the hearing loop, what it is with it, the hearing loop, and then at the very end of it, you'll see a uh, test uh, sample of a beta program for transcription of live programming, so. This is the sign that means a word. Business not business is not purely a for-profit, non-profit, or medical versus consumer and enhancement line. At the same time, invented in the 30s was the prefrontal lobotomy. Not such a good treatment, although the guy who invented it won the Nobel Prize in medicine or physiology in 1948. So sometimes these things don't turn out, sometimes they turn out better than we expect, sometimes they turn out worse than we expect. We need to know how good they are and how safe they are. If they are good enough and safe enough, that's fine as a consumer product. And that's actually the line the FDA draws with things like over-the-counter drugs. You can get Tylenol over the counter because although it's not perfectly safe, it's safe enough and effective enough that they figure you can use it without a doctor's prescription. You cannot get brain surgery over the counter because they figure no matter, even, even Jordan can't successfully perform brain surgery on himself in a way that's safe and effective. So I think safety and efficacy are the most important, but so as you can see, there are many advantages to hearing loops. Simple for people of all ages to operate. They're cost effective as they can be used by two or 200 people at the same time. They're universal with the same signal serving everyone, no matter the location and their hearing instrument manufacturer. And as you saw, the exciting opportunity for live transcriptions for those of hard of hearing. Uh, can I get the slides back up, please? Uh, making the library and observatory rooms that house our programming accessible to individuals with hearing loss not only proves our dedication to serving our residents and visitors, but also exceeds the standards for the American Disabilities Act. As you can see, we will be housing the hearing assistance loop in the community room, Anningberg room, the popular reading room, children's room, the quiet study room, and the conference room. In addition to inside the library, we will be offering the hearing loop on the obs obs observatory deck and the observatory dome. The project came to us. Um, we've been talking about doing the hearing loop at the library for quite some time. Um, we have the opportunity today um, to take advantage of a generous donation. The Bartosz Family Foundation came to us and asked us for a project that would offer the benefits to all residents, but not necessarily in the realm of programming. Um, the Bartosz Family Foundation already supports the foundation in $10,000 for all of our music programs. Um, so today I want to take a moment to thank the Bartosz Family Foundation. Uh, so as we were presenting ideas to them, we talked about the hearing assistance loop, and they said that is the one that we want to be a part of. Um, so we uh, spoke with them. Uh, I told them that if we're going to do the library, I think the opportunity to do the observatory is uh, just as important. And so they took their $30,000 donation and raised it another $10,000 to help us cover the co some costs for the observatory as well. So the Hearing Loop Project total cost is $66,587, which would be funded by the Library and Observatory's Capital Improvement Project budget, which would not require an adjustment as, an inclu as inclusive with this project, we would still be under budget for our fiscal 1819 capital improvement. Uh, I'm sorry, can I get the slides up one more time? <laughs> All right, um, so that's just a breakdown of each of the rooms. Uh, we will be getting a 5% uh, project discount on top of the 20% uh, government discount that we've already received. Um, this here is just another uh, physical or uh, example of how the hearing loop will work. The Annenberg room is a wire layout. It's an 11-ray system. 
So it's 11, rate, uh, 11 uh, systems overlaying each other so that we get uh, ample coverage throughout the room. This will be the largest room uh, that will need to be covered. And this here is a sample of the installation uh, for the city of Chandler Public Library. As you can see, we will rip out our carpet tiles. We will lay the copper wire underneath. Um, so it's a fairly seamless uh, transition. Uh, we're anticipating construction taking uh, less than about two days. Um, and that's all the rooms in the observatory. So um, at that time, at this time, it concludes my presentation. I can answer any questions. Okay, I have one question. Uh, I actually do. Uh, the one that you mentioned for out on the deck of the observatory, mm -hmm. can you explain a little bit about how that happens? So it's the same, uh, same software. Uh, Eric McLaughlin, our city astronomer, will be hooked up to an amplifier. And within that amplifier, anybody that has a hearing assistance device will be able to hear him clearly. Um, so that is uh, those that have hearing assistance devices that have T-coils in them. That's about 70% of uh, hearing aids at this time. In addition to um, the hearing loop, we will also be getting 30 uh, individual. So if today I'm having a hard time hearing, I can actually plug it in just kind of like a, a CD player or portable Walkman like they used to be, hook them up and actually put them on my ears as well. So um, anybody, that, even if you don't have hearing aids, we still will have the ability to have them here. How wonderful, amazing. Any other comments or questions? Question, please. Okay. Aaron, um, as far as the individual coming into the facility, how do they know that this program is available to them? So the, uh, the standard uh, sign, the, the ear with the T-coil inside of it, um, will be placed at each of the locations, um, as well as we will be doing a global marketing event uh, with uh, OdaJoy. Um, that is part of their proposed package. Um, in addition to that, we will actually do several programs um, that we will have a, um, and I do apologize, but an ear doctor um, come in and will actually be able to help people turn on their T-coils if they do not have that available to them. So we'll be doing multi-levels uh, of uh, marketing for them. Fantastic program. Great job. Aaron, this is, I thought this was going to be like an upgrade to a system that we had, but we never had this. So this is a brand new installation. Uh, so right? we, we did have a hearing That's assistance, um, and it did not come to council this just based is on the, the sign amount. that it means a very low amount. Um, we went to quotes at that time. Um, unfortunately, we went with the lowest bidder, and with the lowest bidder, we got some uh, subpar uh, performance and some equipment. Um, we tried to have a company come in and help us uh, bring it back to life, and every company we had said, absolutely, we cannot do this. It's just... Right. So we went back out, and um, OdaJoy was the second uh, quote that we got for the last time we went around. They were the one we should have gone with the first time. Um, and they are, uh, they've are they been absolutely wonderful. Good. So it's not an upgraded brand new. No, we will be doing a brand new installation. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. I have one other question. As long as you're here, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but maybe you can talk a little bit about the um, legacy naming opportunities and uh, how people would get information about that. Absolutely. If they, if they want to name a bookcase, if they want to name a room, uh, whatever is up out there that's uh, unnamed, how people would go about it. Okay. Uh, we have many opportunities at the Library and Observatory. Uh, the Library and Observatory Foundation um, has created a literary legacy policy or a packet, and um, there's many opportunities. So as the mayor said, there are bookcases. You can name programs. Um, there are rooms that can be named. Um, there are many different assets. Um, we can, you can name a book. You can name a collection of books. Um, there's a multitude of different ways you can do that. Um, but you can also, two uh, donate or to name a uh, project, you can go onto our website, uh, ranchermiragelibrary.org, and uh, on our slides, there's a literary legacy pamphlet that you can take a look at. Or if you'd like to come into the facility, I would be more than happy to walk you around and show you all the opportunities. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, developing um, more opportunities in the very near future and bringing those to council. Okay, so if people cannot have a naming opportunity with their donation, can they sponsor an event with a contribution? 
Yeah, so actually uh, sponsoring an event is a literary legacy. Any type of naming opportunity through the library and observatory is through the literary legacy policy. So if um, you want to donate $250 to a lecture on coyotes, um, and that's what's something on our program, uh, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, we, have naming, or we have naming opportunities from as low as 25,000 up to close, to, or actually the low, highest one at this time is half a million dollars for our community room. Okay. Yeah, and just to add that uh, any donation, that is a 501c3, so it's obviously uh, tax deductible. Uh, and that organization is vitally important to the success of the programming at our library. Um, and that organization also has no salaries and benefits. So all of your donation goes to the intended purpose. Okay, lots of good information. Thank you. All right, so council has no further questions or comments. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that would like to comment or ask a question? Oh, okay, we have somebody. Please state your name and... Uh, yes, hi, Brad you. Anderson, uh, City Ranch Mirage, Forward Drive. Uh, I think it's a great thing. It sounds like a very positive... I have friends that have hearing difficulties, and uh, they're always upgrading their, their hearing aids. And, but I never thought of the library as a place that you want to listen. So it's, I thought reading glasses, they should have reading glasses. Because if I don't go with these, I'm out of luck. But uh, I, I, the, the T-coil uh, was interesting because I, I'm all for the 30 units because I, I have a hard time hearing too. And I would probably take advantage of that too, uh, the individual units. But the T-coil, I don't know, maybe you can answer this. Uh, is that something you would turn on and off? Is that going to hamper their listening when they're not in the library? Or is that something that they would want to do? That's my only question. But it sounds like a great, great uh, program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the T-coil, uh, as I said, is in about 70% of hearing aids at this time. Um, they're actually in some of the uh, cochlear, the implanted ear, uh, hearing aids as well. Um, you do have to turn them on. Um, but once they're turned on, as long as you are within the setting of where the sound is coming from, you are able to hear it. The moment I walk outside of the boundary of that area, you no longer get the amplified sound. Um, now, if you were to walk from our library and then go into a movie theater that were to have it, you wouldn't need to turn it back on. It would automatically be on. And then once you're in that system, you're automatically connected to it. So it's not something you have to turn on and off. Once you turn it on, you're all set to go. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, anyone else from the audience? All right, seeing, no, no, seeing none, we will just close the uh, public comments and move on to a, uh, a motion in a second. All right, let me make a motion that the library board approve the city manager and city attorney to enter into a contract with Odo Joy for the Hearing Loop project and to add the project as a literary legacy opportunity. Okay, may I have a second? Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Christy. Okay. Well, we are finished with the agenda at this point, and we are now going to go into closed session. And uh, Steve, would you take it from here? I sure will, ma'am. Mayor? I mean, first of all, it would be great if, uh, for those of us who are information technology impaired, if there was an IT loop that turned us into <laughs> computer geeks as soon as we walked in the room. That would be nice. Someday. Uh, the City Council this time is going to recess into closed session to confer with the um, City Attorney, me, regarding existing litigation pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9. And that involves a case known as Horizon Pacific Rancho Cove, LLC, versus City of Rancho Mirage. The council will also confer with its labor no negotiator, which is me, pursuant to government code section 54957.6, regarding the, an unrepresented employee known as the city manager slash executive director. That's it. That's it. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, we are now in adjournment, and we look forward to seeing everyone next time. Thank you. Have a great day.